Welcome to Food for Thought, the place to explore, celebrate, and manifest a life motivated and defined by unconditional compassion and optimal wellness. My name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau, and I'm your host. My work is dedicated to empowering people to live according to their own values of compassion and wellness. You can learn more about who I am and what I do by visiting my website, joyfulvegan.com. And you can also join thousands whose lives have been changed by the 30 Day Vegan Challenge and get yourself on board with it today at 30dayveganchallenge.com. And here's something fun to share the 30 Day Vegan Challenge book is now award winning. The Independent Publishers Book Awards chose it as a silver winner in its category. So I'm very excited. The 30 Day Vegan Challenge is officially an award-winning book, 30dayveganchallenge.com. Today's topic is the best animal mothers, human and non-human. A few fun announcements before we get to this special episode. We just wrapped up our special April version of the 30 Day Vegan Challenge, and we're doing another in June. In these special versions of the 30 Day Vegan Challenge, I offer lots of extras in addition to what's already there. You can sign up anytime you want and start getting the information, the videos, the recipes, the resources, all of the content anytime you start the program as soon as you sign up. But if you're doing these special versions, you get lots of extras, including new videos and new recipes and new content, live weekly Q&As with me, live cooking demonstrations, video demonstrations, and really awesome giveaways. We just gave away a brand new high-powered Blendtec blender, a 30-day supply of so delicious non-dairy goodies, a 30-day supply of delicious vegan chocolate bars from Endangered Species Chocolate, and three copies of The Daily Vegan, which, by the way, is a new spinoff of my book, Vegan's Daily Companion. It's a beautiful journal. So you can check that out over at joyfulvegan.com. But it was three people won each a copy of The Daily Vegan. So you can join 30 Day Vegan Challenge at any time. But if you join in June, this is June 2015, you'll get lots of extras. I encourage you also to get the book and the online program for a discount. And you can see that special package over at 30dayveganchallenge.com. If you sign up anytime between now and June, it's no problem. We will just reset your start date to June 1st. Also, today's episode is brought to you by listeners like you, as well as Nature's Food and the American Anti-Vivisection Society. More about the amazing work of AAVS in a bit. Nature's Food has been a part of my daily routine for quite some time now, and you might want to make it a part of yours as well. You know, one of the most common questions we vegans are asked is, where do you get your protein? And Nature's Food is the answer to that question, literally. Nature's Food brand products. It's a new premium vegan brand available exclusively at GNC. All of their products are vegan-friendly, non-GMO, free of dairy, soy, and gluten, and made from high-quality, hand-selected ingredients that contain no artificial flavors, sweeteners, or preservatives. I've personally been enjoying the organic protein powder in my daily smoothies, which delivers 18 grams of 100% plant-based protein. Nature's Food, which is USDA organic protein, features a superior 100% brown rice protein, making it ideal for supporting lean muscle, strength, and recovery, and it's perfect for active lifestyles. Since I'm traveling as I produce this particular episode, I even packed it up with me. There's also a plant based fit protein powder, and even an all-in-one meal. Perfect boost choice whenever you are on the go, like I am right now. Just look for the green Nature's Food logo on the blue and white packaging at your local GNC. There's a photo of it, of course, on joyfulvegan.com, but you can also right now go to gnc.com Use the promo code 26381 and you will save $5 off of any Nature's Food product. So go to gnc.com, search for the Nature's Food brand and get $5 off. It's what's inside that counts. So check out Nature's Food products for yourself and see why. Thank you to listeners who are supporting this podcast and other content I produce. If you're confident in the impact this work has in the world, then I urge you to support it. You can go to joyfulvegan.com, click on support in the menu under shop and you can either join monthly and become a monthly supporter or you can make a one-time donation. I thought this topic, the best animal mothers, both human and non-human, was 
Great. <laughs> it's a great topic for the timing, considering that today, as you're listening to this, is Mother's Day in the U.S. And I'm in New Jersey right now, as you listen to this, celebrating this Mother's Day with my mother and my mother-in-law. And I also thought it was important to talk about this topic in terms of drawing connections between human animals and non-human animals to emphasize that we are more alike than we are different. And even those differences don't mean we have a right to exploit or hurt someone else, of course. We tend to be a pretty anthropocentric species, and so as such, we tend to want to protect those who are similar to us, and we tend to other those who are not like us. And of course, these are very tenuous and dubious lines that we draw, and the more we dissolve these boundaries, the better for everybody. So I thought it would be valuable to celebrate what we have in common when it comes to maternal instincts, maternal bonding, motherhood, and mothering in every aspect of that word. Now, I have talked about this in quite a few episodes when I talk about specifically the bond between female cows, bovines, and their babies, and how we completely exploit that bond, and we exploit that instinctive reproductive cycle when we impregnate cows just to keep them pregnant in order to stimulate lactation so we can take their milk. And it is, to me, one of the most offensive things we do in the animal farming industry that we do. So you can go back and listen to some of those episodes. You can also find all sorts of lists online uh, when you search for best animal mothers. And though I find a lot of these websites and lists cute to look at because there's always cute pictures, there are so many cute pictures, I don't think a lot of them offer a lot of substance in terms of what the criteria for a great mother are. And I wanted to offer my perspective. So I started thinking about, well, what do I think are the criteria for great moms, right? Now, we generalize about how non-human and even human animal mothers behave, uh, what makes them great, what makes us admire them. And of course, we can make generalizations as long as we remember that we're talking about individuals as well. And of course, there are always exceptions to the rule, to the generalizations. So even though I'm singling out only a few species for their impressive mothering skills, that doesn't mean females from every species aren't also good moms. Of course they are. They are good for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is that they have successfully overcome the great hurdles of evolution. The reason any animal species is here with us today is because they had good mothers. Otherwise they, their ancestors would not have survived. So all of us can celebrate mothers in general, just by virtue of any of us being here. We also tend to measure others according to our own traits and use those traits as the barometers by which we value other species and and we measure them against those values that we hold dear. But just because they don't resemble us in every way doesn't mean they aren't good mothers. I think we're tempted to empathize with and appreciate mammals more than any other group of animals because they look like us and we can identify with them. That's pretty you know, common. I understand why we do that. So I think it's important to look at the things we have in common more than looking at our differences. One thing that I think is the main criteria, and it seems obvious, but it's worth saying that makes good mothers is making sure that the offspring is born safely. Sadly, for one reason or another, there are certainly human mothers who are even able to do even this much, bring their offspring to term safely. So that's really the first criterion for what makes a good mother is ensuring the safety of the newborn. And we see this in every species from insects all the way up to mammals. Number two would be giving the offspring the skills they need to be able to successfully fend for themselves, to survive, to thrive, and to pass on their genes, and then letting them go to do these things. I think we humans can identify with the difficulty of letting go, but we see non-human animals do this all the time. And, you know, this in some animals, it happens within a few days with some non-human animals it happens with in eight years, 10 years. I mean, so it really depends on the animal we're talking about, but everybody does let go eventually if we can and let the offspring kind of survive on their own or within the new group they have created. Alligator and crocodile moms are pretty amazing. I am quite in awe of alligators and crocodiles They remind me of sharks in the sense that they're just these remnants of prehistoric days. They're so 
just amazing. <laughs> I just, I'm in awe of them and I'm, I really have a lot of respect for them. And considering how scary alligators and crocodiles can be to us humans, I'm just amazed in terms of their mothering skills. They pick up their little babies, these little tiny babies that have hatched in these bone crushing jaws and they gently transport them from their nest, this incredible nest they create for them, and they transport them into the water. It's pretty phenomenal when you consider how easily they could hurt these tiny little creatures. And I'm just in awe. And then, of course, they stay with their young. They can stay with their young for up to a year. And sadly, alligators and crocodiles are terribly demonized, especially in the U.S. They're victims of great cruelty and exploitation. They have been bred and farmed to kill. They're killed for their skin. They've been hunted for sport for their flesh and their skin. They're bought and sold as part of the exotic pet trade. They're kept in zoos and they've been used for attractions like gator wrestling. And of course, as with so many species, the greatest threat is currently destruction of habitat. And this includes water management systems and increased levels of mercury and dioxins in the water. If we could appreciate these animals for the characteristics we say we value, perhaps we could change our perception of them and thus our exploitation of them. I wish that were the case. I do hold hope. We need to change our perceptions of non-human animals in order to see what we have in common so that we can respect that rather than exploit it. Unfortunately, like I said, we do tend to exploit the very thing we need. Obviously, that's what the exploitation is when it comes to cows, because we need to keep them pregnant in order to stimulate lactation to take their milk. And it's that very thing that is fundamental for mothering is to have this offspring. And so we do exploit that. But I do feel like the more we see these relationships between non-human animal mothers and their young, I think it is very moving for people. I know I've heard from just thousands of people who have found my work specifically talking about taking the babies away from dairy cows and how traumatized the cows are from this experience and how much they relate to you know what it would feel like if their young were taken away so i do think that talking about mothers just in general when it comes to non-human animal mothering is really powerful and i think we need to pass these stories on and we can do that when it comes to alligators as well they fiercely defend their young from predators fiercely defend their young they build these protected nests for their young as i said and they care for them with great tenderness once they're transporting them from their nest to the safety in the water and they remain with their young for up to a year they sound like pretty awesome moms to me. So they get to be on my list, (laughs) my personal list. We can all create our own list. So that's number two is the skill to bring our children to safety, to be able to fend for themselves until we let go and leave them to fend for themselves. Number three is aloe mothering. This is my third criterion in terms of what makes great mothers. This is my personal favorite. Aloe mothering refers to parenting that's performed by non-related members of a social group other than the genetic parents to help raise the young. Now, many birds and mammals do this as well. There are vervets and cebus monkeys, squirrel monkeys, and macaques. They're all known for aloe mothering. And of course, in the human species, there are instances of aloe mothering among such groups as the Effie, if I'm pronouncing that correct? Um, EFE and the Aka pygmies of Central Africa. Now, many of us are familiar with aloe mothering among elephants. And I think it's one of the things that I appreciate so much about elephants. It's one of the things I love so much about them, that the females in each herd, now each herd is made up of about 10 individuals and led by the most experienced matriarch in that group. So there are groups, you know, there are herds of about 10 individuals And each of these individuals help each other find food and care for the calves. And I love that communal mothering that takes place in which sisters and aunts and other females help care for the baby. This is part of the social order. Now, it's a little different than what we see in our society today, where people outside of our genetic families are hired to care for our young, either in nanny situations or daycare facilities. But many people do raise their children in communal situations. And many of us, myself included, chose surrogate moms for ourselves when we were young and even older adults to fill in some gaps left by our own parents. So I love this concept of aloe mothering, you know, loosely and strictly. Strictly, we see it in certain groups like elephants and loosely, I think we can also all create our own aloe mothers. Definitely something we can take from 
non-human animals and, and implement in our own lives. I've had many older women act as surrogate moms for me, which is incredibly special. I have many, I have so many memories of women who in different parts of my life, different times of my life, um, acted as surrogate moms for me and aloe mothered me, um, which is really special. But it's a little different than these non-human animal ants and non-related females carrying the young, grooming the young, nursing the young, providing food, protecting infants from predators. But I still think we perform loose aloe parenting for one another. And I think it's one of the qualities that makes great mothers, whether you're raising your own children or not, we can all be aloe mothers to others in our lives. And it is one of the things I said I love about elephants. And as you know, the elephant herd is considered one of the most closely knit societies of any animal. And a female will only leave if she dies or is captured by humans. It's the only way females will leave their herd. It's just so amazing to watch how dedicated they are to their offspring, but also to other members of that herd. And of course, as you know, the threat against elephants in the wild is growing worse every day. And I fear that in my lifetime, we will see the end of elephants in the wild unless we do something now. I know I don't usually sound so hopeless and I'm sorry to bring that that tinge of sadness to the podcast, but I'm really feeling really, really scared about what we're doing to the largest land animals on the planet. And it really breaks my heart. Um, and I do think we can help. I really do think we can. I will tell you where I see hope and where I'm helping. And I'll also share with you two more criteria for what makes great mothers and share some animals, non-human animals and human animals who are fitting that criteria. But I really want to give a shout out to another one of our sponsors, the American Anti-Vivisection Society, who is one of my go-to voices for animals. They have been protecting non-human animals and non-human mothers for over 130 years. I am so proud to be affiliated with them. The American Anti-Vivisection Society at AAVS.org is dedicated to ending the use of animals in science. Talk about animals who are exploited for their mothering capabilities. There's so many, so many, so many stories of animals who are used for breeding and they just take their babies away. Non-human primates and other mammals where they're just used as breeders and they lose their offspring. And AAVS is seeking to stop this. Um, ending the use of animals in science through education, advocacy, and the development of alternative methods. They are instrumental behind making sure that tax dollars do not contribute to research that benefits the meat industry because right now they do via the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center. Its sole aim is to minimize costs and maximize profits for the meat industry. And a New York Times investigation revealed shocking animal cruelty and neglect. You can read it at aavs.org slash meat. This takes place because there is no federal law protecting animals used in agriculture research. The Animal Welfare Act specifically excludes cows, pigs, and sheep from coverage when used in agriculture research, and only Congress can stop this horrific animal suffering. In response to this cruelty, a bipartisan bill was introduced into Congress, the Animal Welfare in Agricultural Research Endeavors. It's called the Animal Welfare in Agricultural Research Endeavors, the AWARE Act, and this will amend the Animal Welfare Act to include protection for animals used in agricultural research at federal labs. Please contact your legislators today and ask them to support the AWARE Act. Tag AAVS. Let them know that you're speaking on their behalf. Let them know that you're speaking on behalf of the animals. Please go to Twitter, go to Facebook, go to Instagram, wherever you can, where people are following you. If a few people see your post after you go and contact your legislators by going to AAVS, AVS.org, then you post this and let other people be inspired to do the same. I really encourage you to do that. The bill is steadily gaining support in both the House and the Senate, and it's important to contact your legislators today. Let's get this one taken care of. We have so much we need to do for animals. Let's just check this one off, get it done, and we can get it done with you and your help. Go to AAVS.org contact your legislators and ask them, urge them to support the AWARE Act. So my fourth criterion is related to what we can do for elephants. And the criterion is adoptions, adopting animals within or outside of your own species. Now, of course, humans, adopting humans is something we've seen a lot in our own lives. We know plenty of people 
who adopt non-human and human animals. So we do adopt within and outside of our own species. And speaking of adopting, I am a foster mom of an orphaned elephant named Zogulini. And her mother was shot by poachers. And Zogulini was found by the rescuers at David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust. This organization there in Kenya I am just in awe of what they are doing. They are rescuing orphans and they are trying to stop poaching and they're rescuing orphans and healing them and giving them everything they need to then be reintroduced back into the wild. I'm so impressed with what they're doing and reading the stories of these individual orphans absolutely breaks my heart breaks the heart of the people who are doing this work, but they're doing it. They're on the ground doing this work. And the rescuers found Zongolini fiercely protecting her mother who lie dying from gunshot wounds. And this little elephant, this little calf was so desperate. She was drinking her mother's urine to survive. And there are photos on their website where they're, you know, the rescuers, these grown men are in tears witnessing this because she was so desperate to stay close to her mother. She did not want to leave her mother and she was there and she was going to die herself if they didn't rescue her and take her from her mother. But they had to make first the very difficult decision to euthanize her mother and rescue her. She was 18 months young when she was rescued and brought to Sheldrick Sanctuary in March of 2012. And as with all of the elephant and rhino orphans they rescue, the intention is to release them back into the wild. And you can also see the stories of Zongolini and every single orphan they have rescued. It's amazing. And you can also support their anti-poaching programs where they basically go out and they remove snares and they do so much. So if you'd like to become a foster parent like me, I really urge you to go to sheldrickwildlifetrust.org. You can find their website off of joyfulvegan.com, especially on the show notes for today's episode. You can read the story of these amazing rescues and you can choose an orphan who you would like to foster. To date, David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust has successfully hand raised over 150 infant elephants. So I'm very proud and very happy to be a foster mom. I'm really grateful for the work they're doing, though I would love to provide hands-on foster care and adoption if I could. I don't know. Someday I might just take off and just go to Africa and just work hands-on with these people who are doing, to me, just the most amazing work in the world. But as it's not possible to do that right now, I'm at least grateful that I can adopt in this way and foster Zongolini and the work that they're doing. It's really the next best thing. Now, of course, I have participated in direct cross-species adoption in the sense that I am very much a human mother to two kitties who are my babies. And I am a damn good mom. It's, of course, not unusual for humans to adopt other animals, both in their own species and outside of it. As I said, we adopt dogs and cats and rabbits and many, many, many animals. And many other animals do this as well. It's not just humans who adopt outside their own species. Many animals do this too. And experts have been looking into why this is the case. They have been looking into why this is the case for years. Cross-species adoptions are relatively common among domestic animals, and it's occasionally seen in the wild. Wild. And you may have seen some of these highlighted. There's a really special book that came out in 2011. I remember when it came out. It came out right around the time the 30 Day Vegan Challenge first came out, the original edition. I remember seeing it on the counter of many bookstores when I was there for 30 Day. And it's called Unlikely Friendships. And it's a very sweet little book made up of incredibly lovely photographs of these relationships. Some examples include a dog who nursed a baby squirrel as part of her own litter. There are captive apes who treated cats like infant apes, a dog who watched over a baby owl. And in the 2013 book by the same author, Holland, Unlikely Loves, there are many more stories, including a Dalmatian who adopts a calf, who happens to wear Dalmatian-like spots. There's a goat who helps a young giraffe learn self-confidence. There's a hen who sits on her pups to keep them warm. They're just, we love seeing this. We all love seeing these kind of interspecies adoptions. Experts speculate on why this happens. It turns out that the motivations vary and mirror our own. Some of it's instinct, right? Even if they're not related, there is some hardwiring that takes place compelling someone 
to care for another. So there's some hardwiring that takes place. Some of it stems from mutual benefit. We get benefit when we adopt another, when we take care of another. And a lot of these stories feature nursing females who begin nursing orphans outside of their own species, some of which may be due to high levels of oxytocin, which is the bonding hormone that's so prevalent in nursing females. Whatever the reason, I think it's something all species have in common, and I like that we all share it. So adoption within our own species and outside of it is my kind of my fourth criterion for what I think makes great moms. Finally, my fifth criterion of what, when I look at kind of like what makes a great mom is some kind of personal sacrifice. And I don't mean that the mother becomes a saint or a martyr, because I don't think every mom has to be as self-effacing as Stella Dallas. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but there was a movie made in 1937 starring Barbara Stanwyck called Stella Dallas. And she, it's like the ultimate story of a mother sacrificing her life and her happiness for that of her daughter. So if you want to watch like a Mother's Day film, if like you were looking for like a mother's, like a quintessential Mother's Day film, (laughs) which is very sad, go watch Stella Dallas. The original with Barbara Stanwyck was very good. There was also a remake in 1990 with Bette Midler called Stella. So I don't mean sainthood like this character, which was just over the top. I don't think she had to go to the lengths that she did, but she felt that she did. What am I thinking of? I'm thinking of also, what's the other, um, what's that other movie? (laughs) The Joan Crawford movie. That's also an ultimate sacrifice. Mildred Pierce. Mildred Pierce also. I mean, her daughter was pretty naughty and I would just, I don't know. I don't know if I could have stuck around with that daughter, but Mildred Pierce also She pays a pretty high price for being a mother. So those are two Mother's Day, well, three, I guess, Mother's Day films, if you want to watch them. Stella Dallas, Stella, and Mildred Pierce. But I don't believe that you have to, you know, become a martyr or a saint to use that as a barometer for being a good mother, but kind of like, you know, going above and beyond, right? Which some of you might argue all mothers do. So perhaps in that way, every single mother is an amazing mother. I'll give you that. When I look at non-human animals, a few stand out. So when you look at like polar bears and octopuses, orcas and emperor penguins, not only do female emperor penguins have to lay a huge egg, okay, a huge egg, they then have to leave this egg behind to walk as far as 50 miles in the freezing cold in the snow in order to gorge themselves on fish. And they can't even keep all the fish down. Then they make the trek back to regurgitate their fish, this feast, to their chicks. Now, I have to say, I really have to give some props, though, to the male emperor penguins because they are also sacrificing while the female is gone. He is standing in a huddle, like a bunch of them stand in a huddle in these frigid winds, protecting the egg between his legs until, until the egg hatches. So I don't know, like that's a pretty amazing sacrifice. These, these, these animals have to make just to make sure her newborn is, is hatched safely. It's pretty crazy. Now, if you think New human mothers get too little rest during the first month of their newborn's life. The orca, which they're also called killer whales. I really look forward to doing away with that. So I'd like to dispense with that. But the orca story, I think, will put things in perspective. Orca calves don't sleep at all the first month of their lives, which means mommy doesn't sleep either. Instead, they swim continuously, which helps them to avoid predators and build important muscle and fat reserves. So you think as a new mom, you don't get any sleep. Just try being an orca mom. Polar bears. After getting pregnant, female polar bears need to eat enough to nearly double their weight because they will soon enter a long fasting period where they will still need to provide nourishment to their cubs. But as temperatures start to fall during autumn, mothers to be they dig a maternity den that comprises kind of a narrow entrance tunnel and like one to three chambers. And then she secludes herself in her den and she enters this kind of hibernation like state. And unlike hibernating animals, her body temperature does not decrease and she does not sleep continuously, but she also completely goes into a fasting period. So whereas these poor emperor penguins are gorging themselves, the polar bears are starving themselves. And ultimately, you know, they're doing this so that they can nurture and nourish their young. But octopuses might... 
and they might completely win. And again, this is kind of more of a Stella Dallas kind of story because I don't think we want to model ourselves after octopuses in any way. I think they sacrifice themselves the most because unfortunately they tend to die after they have made sure that their young is safe. It's so sad. So they don't even snack these octopuses. They first of all will make sure that they're taking care of their eggs for just a long, long, long period of time, especially the deep sea octopus. They kind of protect them. I think they have about like 160, 150. There are some octopuses that have thousands and thousands of eggs, but they lose so many. In this case, she's taking care of all 160 eggs and she spends 53 months of her very short life clinging to a rock, not taking in any food to make sure that these eggs are safe. And she doesn't eat at all. And she dies shortly thereafter. But first she makes sure that her babies are taken care of and that they have the necessary oxygen protection to survive. So I think octopuses might win in terms of the ultimate sacrifice or Barbara Stanwyck or Joan Crawford win. I don't know. We, we should have a contest to see who is the better mom who sacrificed the most. So my sacrifice certainly isn't as great as that as a kitty mom. And I don't know that we should make it as great as I don't want my sacrifice to be that great. I like, you know, I'll sit longer than I should because one or both of my cats is on my lap while my bladder grows impatient and painful. Like that's my sacrifice to my kitty babies. Or when I feed them, I have to make sure that Charlie doesn't eat Michiko's food. So I'll kind of stand around. Imagine me telling my sitters, like when I'm giving instructions to my cat sitters, like, so after like you feed them, can you just watch a little bit? So like Charlie doesn't eat Michiko's food. So I'll like stand around and like, whatever, check mail or something or listen to the radio while I'm making sure that Charlie doesn't eat Michiko's food. That's my little sacrifice. Or when they're eating, Michiko like kind of doesn't like to be disturbed when she's eating. So David will want to come into the kitchen to like get a beer from the fridge. And I'm like, no, Michiko's eating. You can't come in right now. (laughs) That's like, that's my sacrifice. Or when I go outside, lots of times at lunchtime, I just want to go out. I've been writing. I'm tired. I want to just go relax and just sit and not do anything and not have to worry about anything. But I will bring the cats outside with me because they want to go outside so badly. But it means I have to watch them and I can't just relax. So that's a sacrifice I make. It's no Mildred Pierce. It's no octopus. But I do make little sacrifices. Whatever. I do. We all do. And that's really, frankly, in my opinion, called motherhood. One of the things that I feel pretty strongly about is that the sacrifices we do make as mothers or allo mothers or adopted mothers, foster mothers, whatever we consider ourselves as mothers, that we don't expect repayment for these sacrifices. In my opinion, that is what motherhood is, that we make these sacrifices. That's part of motherhood and we don't expect repayment in return. That's my opinion. So those are my criteria. So just ensuring the safety of the newborn, giving offspring the skills they need to survive, then letting them go. Allo mothering, adopting and sacrificing, going above and beyond and not expecting repayment in return. And we might even use some of these criteria for ourselves to determine what kind of mothers we are or for assessing what kind of mothering we've experienced or just appreciating our mothers, all mothers, some mothers, non-human animal mothers, but no matter what we conclude, I'm really glad there's a special day we can stop and honor motherhood. I did a little preparation. Obviously, I always do preparation for the episodes, but I did a little poking around about the history of Mother's Day. And I found out that a woman named Anna Jarvis from West Virginia, that's in the East Coast of the United States, for those who don't know. And she started Mother's Day in 1905. Her own mother died. She began campaigning when her mother died to make Mother's Day a recognized holiday in the United States. And Anna's mission was to honor her own mother by continuing the work she started and to set aside a day to honor mothers. I want to say this because you've probably heard me talk about how Thanksgiving was you know, the reason there's a national holiday called Thanksgiving is because of one woman who lobbied to make this happen. You know, we can do this for the kinds of things we care about. You see it happening all the time. And uh, we do have World Farm Animals Day. We do have World Vegetarian Day, that kind of thing. But I don't know, you know, maybe there's something we need to consider about a day, you know, in terms of really honoring non-human animals or day of compassion or something like that. 
But anyway, the point is that, you know, it just takes some tenacity on the part of some really strong, in this case, woman, again, who made this happen. And I'll talk about that more. But I read on Wikipedia that Jarvis soon became resentful of the commercialization of this holiday. And she was angry that companies would profit from the holiday. It said by the early 1920s, Hallmark and other companies started selling Mother's Day cards. And Jarvis became so embittered by what she saw as a misinterpretation and exploitation that she protested and even tried to rescind Mother's Day. So this just goes to show that, you know, once you put something out in the world, you have to let go because you don't have any control of what happens from there. And that includes children. That includes ideas. And no one knows that better than mothers. That's why letting go is one of the criterion for being a good animal mom, human or non-human, that I look up to when you can really let go. There's an amazing story. I just remembered this. There's an amazing story. Actually, it might even be... It might even be called Sacrifices or or Mothers or Mother Sacrifice. I don't know if you listen to This American Life on NPR, but there was a story of a woman who adopted a young boy from Russia, and he had many, many different issues, I mean, mostly related to the inability to bond, which is what happens to a lot of children in orphanages who aren't held in the first several months of their lives. They have this inability to bond, basically. And I'll tell you, my sister actually adopted a little boy from Russia now 13 years ago, and there have been problems ever since. They have been working with him since he was a toddler. He was nine months old, and he was not held in the first few months of his life um, in these orphanages, and it's just awful. And so it really affects you um, chemically. The wiring in your brain just gets, it's just different. And so there was a story of this woman who had adopted this boy, and as he was getting older, he was becoming more difficult, and he eventually was becoming violent specifically toward her. And I was, God, I was just so in awe of this woman because what she kept emphasizing was that it wasn't about he didn't love her, that even if he never did, that wasn't his job, (laughs) like that he didn't, that she didn't expect him to love her in return for what she was doing. She was just doing it because she was his mother. And I remember she was saying that friends and family who were concerned, you know, people were, you know, it's difficult. It's a really difficult situation to be in who would say to her, why are you doing this? You know, almost kind of saying, why don't you give him back, right? Because he had been adopted. And she said, he's my son. What do you mean, why am I doing this? He's my son. I'm his mother. Like, that was just it. Like, that was the line. Like, this is what I do. And I was just so moved and so touched by the fact that being loved back was never what she wanted in return. And I remember one of the things she said that really struck me and stuck with me Uh, when I was listening, was at the end, this story had turned out well. They did some therapy that's considered controversial, and he completely recovered, and he was able to really kind of change this wiring. And the interviewer said, do you feel like he loves you now? And she said, I don't feel that he wants to hurt me anymore. And that's all that, like, that was her bar, right? (laughs) Which might seem really low to some people, but I just love so much that she didn't expect the love in return. She was just doing what she was doing because she was a mother. And I just think that's incredible. So I really encourage you to go listen to that story. I was really moved by it. I heard that, like, I don't even know, 10 years ago, maybe it wasn't 10 years ago, seven years ago, and it stuck with me ever since. But, you know, regardless of the commercialization of this holiday, I don't know any holiday that's not commercialized, but I'm just really glad that this holiday exists. You know, we're tempted to say that we should honor mothers every day. And of course we should. And of course we can. We shouldn't honor them just one day of the year. Well, you don't have to honor them one day of the year. Honor them every day of the year. Honor your mother every day of the year. That's great. But commemorations such as these help us to remember, helps us to be more mindful, to practice on one day what we want to do every day. We can kind of exercise some new muscles and create some new habits on that day that we can then take with us moving forward, right? They can be triggers for us to do more of what we want to do. And that's a good thing. One of the things David and I have been doing, we've been going back to New Jersey for Mother's Day to see our mothers. And we could pick any time of the year, but it's a special time. It's special for our moms to see us on this day. And so we do it because it means something to them and that's worth it. 
I also want to share with you, because this will be playing a much more central role in my life moving forward, but I'm also going back at this time because my mother has officially been diagnosed with early stage dementia, which, as you probably know, is a progressive disease that's incredibly difficult to experience and witness. I mentioned a couple episodes ago that my mother has aphasia, which means that she's having difficulty articulating herself. She's having difficulty finding words and articulating words, and it appears that it's part of the dementia. So I'm going back to spend really all my time with her and taking her to various doctor appointments and determining what systems we have to put in place to make sure she's taken care of now and in the near and long-term future. So she's no longer able to drive. That's something we were just we know is best. And we have to start looking at options for transportation as well as assisted living. So depending on what things look like, I may be spending more time back East with my mother, which isn't a bad thing. I want to be there to do everything I can to make sure she's okay and to make sure she's safe. And I'm prepared to do that. So here I am in New Jersey and I'll admit I'm going through a lot of sadness right now, a lot of grief, a lot of fear, but there's nothing to do but go through it. And so here I am. My latest NPR piece, my latest KQED opinion piece is about my mother. And though I'm not sure she's going to listen to it, it really is my gift to her for Mother's Day or really the revelation that I had several years ago was really my everyday gift to her and to me. If you'd like to listen to it, it's at joyfulvegan.com under podcast and radio. It was a tough one to write and record, so it's pretty emotional for me, but I'm really proud of it. I'm really proud that it is the KQED Mother's Day perspective. It's the opinion piece for KQED on Mother's Day. It aired just a couple days before Mother's Day, and it aired. I guess now I can say that it officially aired on Mother's Day. So I guess Jarvis would be proud of me for creating something special for my mother on Mother's Day that isn't commercial. It's a nonprofit radio <laughs> commentary. <laughs> so so I think that was what she had in mind. And related to Jarvis's intention from Mother's Day into my mother's dementia, I've actually been sending cards to her every week for the last few months. There's a fantastic online service called Postables. There are probably more services, but I like this one where you can pick a card for any occasion and upload your own photo. You can add a note and they mail it to your recipient. And I love it because it's just easier for me than walking down to the store and buying a card and filling it out and addressing it and finding a stamp and mailing. And that's not to say that I wouldn't put that time into doing that for someone special, but it's even easier because I can do all those things. I'm still picking out a special card. I'm finding the photo and adding that photo and having that printed and then adding a special note. And it's even less expensive. And so I've been using it as an opportunity to trigger her memory about a particular event. I upload a photo, usually of me and her, about a particular event. And I write about what that event was about to help her remember it. It might be the surprise party I threw for her a few years ago or a trip we took together or one of her visits here to California. So it's been enabling me to let her know that she's thought of and appreciated while also using it as a memory exercise for her, for my mother. On Mother's Day, it is a day to celebrate and to honor mothers. And I honor all of you who mother human and non-human animals, who understand that it is about giving and not necessarily getting anything back in return. And I know so many of you do that and do it with grace and do it with humility. And I'm in awe of that. So I would love to hear your own stories, what you think makes a great mom, what your criteria are, examples of great animal moms, human and non-human. Share your stories over at this episode's page at joyfulvegan.com. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the weekly newsletter, leave a comment, drop me a line, become a supporter, and take a look at the new content that I'm sure was not there last time you visited. As always, thank you for subscribing, for supporting, and sharing this podcast. And thank you to our sponsor, the American Anti-Vivisection Society at aavs.org. Please go to aavs.org and get involved. Find your legislator, write them a letter, and urge them to support the AWARE Act. And please share it with your friends and followers. Thank you also to our sponsor, Nature's Food. With their organic vegan products, you can get the added nutrition you want to support your busy lifestyle. Nature's Food is perfect for that reason. And remember, because you're a dedicated listener, you can go to gnc.com and use the promo code 26381 to save $5 off any Nature's Food product. 
I'll end this episode with a beautiful letter I received from Margot that is in keeping with our theme today. Margot wrote, hello, Colleen, I've been meaning to send you an email for a long time, but I've never gotten around to it. I don't have anything in particular that I want to ask you, but considering the enormous positive impact you've had on my life, I feel like I should thank you for everything you've done for me. Three and a half years ago, a friend shared a YouTube video of your talk from Excusitarian to Vegan on her Facebook page, and I began my journey. You showed me what I suppose I had always known in the back of my mind, but had never thought about. When I realized what chickens and cows go through in order for me to eat their eggs and their milk. I was shocked and horrified. I felt sick that I had been part of this cruelty, but also hopeful because you had shown me the solution too. You were instrumental in my decision to become vegan and you continue to inspire me to be as compassionate and kind as possible. Because I had your example to follow, I was able to become vegan and even inspire some friends to become vegetarian and vegan. Thank you for reminding me that just because I can't do everything doesn't mean that I should do nothing. Thank you for informing me of the reasons why eating animals is not in accordance with my values. And thank you for giving me the ability to explain my decision to people with clarity and patience. Thank you for being there for me when staying vegan wasn't easy. I'm so grateful for everything that you do. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words, Margot, And for the animals, this is Colleen Patrick-Gaudreau. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>